Eu, Bula Vinaka, everyone. I thank the Lord for being able to be here at this wonderful camp. Um, I thank him for the life that he has given each one of us that we can have fellowship at this time. Uh, before I begin, just uh, bow your head, close your eyes. Just let me say another word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Thank you for your protection, for your guidance, and for providing for our needs. And we thank you most of all, Father, for the encouragement that has come from the different messages during this camp. And I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit may continue to lead us, that your word may be planted deep in our hearts, that we may be brought closer to you and molded into your image. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a little update, just a few minutes before we open up the scriptures. Um, as most of you know, Back in the islands, we just had a Category 5 uh, cyclone or hurricane, Hurricane Winston. And uh, I've been around for a while now, you can see. And with all the cyclones that we've had in the past, this would be the record-breaking one. Uh, according to the experts, they reckon it's the most powerful cyclone or hurricane to hit in the southern hemisphere ever. And uh, in the whole world, it'll be number two. The biggest one was in the Philippines a few years ago. And no one knew what to expect. This cyclone changed the whole building code structure in Fiji now. Changed the, rewrite the whole thing now. And I guess uh, it would do well for all of us to prepare because it's not going to stop. And uh, you'll have... These calamities will just keep on coming, we know from prophecy. Uh, but I would like to thank the Lord. I mean, even though it was, the best way to describe it is like being inside one pressure cooker, say, for three or four hours. Okay? It was just terrifying. But I praise the Lord that uh, for us back at uh, Navilao, no lives were lost. Uh, a lot of extensive damage, but I mean, the Lord has the last say. And uh, before I forget, I'd just like to acknowledge your help, your contribution in the rebuilding of the place. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your prayers. And uh, I believe the Lord has answered them. We're almost back on our feet now. Thank, thank you for the donations given in cash and in kind to help us uh, rebuild. Uh, much appreciated, and I speak on behalf of the self-supporting network back in Fiji. Um, one, a lot of positives come out of this cyclone. First of all, we were isolated from the rest of the country for the first three to four days. The, the power poles were just crisscrossing over the road. Everything was down. Infrastructure was all down. Uh, water and everything shut off from the markets, and we just had to, I mean, God provided different ways. There's this small uh, shrub that comes up in the gardens after a heavy rain, and we survived on that for the first few days. Uh, we co it's our local version of spinach. Man, it was beautiful. And uh, also, all the left food, we ration it out. And then as soon as the roads open, then we see the different people that God sent. Uh, the first lot, the first two lots were Muslims. And these were ex-patients of the clinic, and one rushed from the other side of the island in their little ute, bringing hot soup and hot... Uh, and another one came from the other side of the island, also ex-patients from Sambeto, and they brought uh, loaves of bread and crackers and all that. And we just praise the Lord for that. And uh, anyway, through the whole experience, one thing come to my mind, it, it drive me, and I believe it did this to a lot of us. It, it make us re-examine now our relationship with God and drive us actually close to God, you know. 
And I just thank the Lord for that. Out of every experience, whether it's a trial or whatever we strike, you know, if the ending's good, well, that's the main part of it all. Don't worry about the beginning or the middle part as long as the ending is good. You know? And uh, like it says in Romans 8, verse 28, all things work us together for those who love the Lord. You'll only have a good ending if you're faithful to God right throughout. If you abandon God, well, you're, you're going to be in a bad place. Uh, but for me personally, it uh, encouraged me to look once again at the book of Job. Because, uh, you know, I started to think, man, why this cyclone hit us? You know? I mean, we, you know, we're supposed to be working for God and all, and why, why that eye of the storm just come right through the middle of us? You know? and, and, oh, by the way, just let me recap a bit. I've always wondered, you know, because I'm not, a, not an aircraft engineer, I always wondered how, how planes, you know, with so many tons of weight, how they can just go up into the air like that, you know? I, I never could figure it out. But after this cyclone, when I see whole houses just tossed up and thrown over the hill and all, I don't wonder anymore about the plane, you know? I mean, 300 plus kilometers an hour, <laughs> man, you know, that take down anything. And whole villages and little towns in Fiji, no more dwellings left, you know? Okay, anyway, so I was thinking then, why thing hit us? I never think about all the... 37,000 people who lost their homes. I just thought, you know, God was concentrating on me or Satan concentrating on me. I say, how this kind of thing happen? And I found this quotation here, which really encouraged me, and I believe it will help you also. It's found in... Um, uh, this is a quotation from the Spirit of Prophecy, taken from Manuscript 56... 1894, quote, it is very natural for human beings to think that great calamities are a sure index of great crimes and enormous sins. But men often make a mistake in thus measuring character. We are not living in the time of retributive judgment. Good and evil are mingled, and calamities come upon all. Sometimes men do pass the boundary line beyond God's protecting care, and then Satan exercises his power upon them, and God does not interpose. So this thing we can expect, you know, all of us. Uh, it's only when you come to the seven last plague, then it is merely targeted to the wicked or those who reject God. As for now, it's free for all. You know? All right, so anyway, we go now to Job chapter 1. In verse 1, Job chapter 1, verse 1, and it says here, There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. I checked up in the Strong's Concordance the other week on this meaning of the word eschew, and it says, put away, leave undone, turn aside, and uh, some other explanations. Eh? So, so that's the kind of man Job was. He was perfect and upright. Now, if we ask the question, you see, it's good to be curious, it's good to ask questions, because while you're answering it, your knowledge is growing. How did Job arrive to be a perfect and an upright man? Okay? How does one gain perfection anyway? Well, when we look at Job's life, he was well acquainted with Jesus. Okay? And that's the beginning of perfection when you know Jesus as a personal friend. And the verse to back that up is found in Job 19 in verse 25. This is how we can prove that Job knew about Jesus. 
chapter 19, verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. See? Job knew very well that his Redeemer was also God. See? That's Jesus Christ. All right, so when we, so Job knew Jesus in 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 21 and 22. It says there that 1 Peter 2, 21 and 22. I'll read this one out. For even hereunto were you called, because Je Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Okay? So when Job followed Jesus, just like the rest of us, you know, Jesus is our example. So we also should come to the stage just like Jesus, no sin, no guile to in our mouths. Eh? All right, John chapter 17, verse 3. When we know Jesus, what will be the result? Someone with quick hands can read this out loud and clear, please. Thank you. So this is life eternal. When we know Jesus Christ continues unto life eternal. Now this is not just a knowing, just a superficial kind of knowledge of Jesus, but it is the kind of knowledge that leads unto obedience. You find that in 1 John in chapter 2 in verse 3. You know, when we know God, we will obey him. Eh? All right. So now how about Job himself? When God looked at him, he was a perfect man. How about Job? When he looked at himself, did he see himself as perfect? Praise the Lord. He never looked at himself as perfect. If you look in Job chapter 9, in verse 20, and by the way, this will apply to all of us. Once we say we're perfect, that will prove that we are perverse. Chapter 9, verse 20. If I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall prove me perverse. Though I were perfect, yet would I not know my soul, I would despise my life. That's why in sanctified life, the spirit of prophecy says, the closer we come to Jesus, the more we show our corruption, we, we think we're so far away, see? So, so the perfect man will not let it go to his head. Right. Okay, let's move down now. This man had seven sons and three daughters. He was a man of great substance, so many thousand sheep, cattle. He's one of the richest men in the East. See? Job. Right. And he, in verse 5, one thing that was... Uh, uh, common with Job was that he would mediate on behalf of his children, okay, offering burnt sacrifices on their behalf. Now, in verse 6 and verse 7, Job chapter 1, if someone like to read verse 6, please. <coughs> Thank you. Now, here we're going to see the beginning of Job's first test. Okay. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also come among them. Now this is like the, the, the uh, heavenly council meeting. Where all the representatives of unfallen worlds, they come and they meet with God. Okay. 
That's what the sons of God are. Let me read this quotation here from Desire of Ages, page 834, talking about the heavenly council room. There is the throne, and around it the rainbow of promise. There are cherubim and seraphim, the commanders of the angel hosts, the sons of God. And then it qualifies it by saying, the representatives of the unfallen world are assembled. The heavenly council before which Lucifer had accused God and his son, the representatives of those sinless domains over which Satan had thought to establish his dominion. So right in this council meeting, as he come in amongst the sons of God, now, those people, they represent their own world. Who are going to represent? Planet Earth. Adam was supposed to go and represent Earth. But Adam eliminated himself. He withdraw. He passed it to Eve. And Eve, when Eve blamed the devil, the devil said, Mine, I'll go and represent Earth. Mm. That's why in, in, uh, in John... John chapter 12, in verse 31, Jesus himself, he referred to Satan as the prince of, prince of this world. That's supposed to be for Adam, okay? But when he managed to get them into sin, so the title now moved to Satan. And so he come up into this heavenly council meeting. All right, what happened next? Now the conversation between Satan and uh, God. Uh, verse 7, please, someone. Right, so this conversation going on now. Oh, where, where you come from? When's comest thou? Walking up and down. In the earth. Here we see that's his favorite pastime, walking up and down on this earth. Okay? If we, why is he walking up and down? Can someone find First Peter five eight, please? First Peter five eight. Be sober. Uh, in case someone is not familiar with the verse, maybe if someone can read it out. That's why he's walking up and down. He's just looking for opportunities, looking for people to tempt and deceive and eventually not only destroy this, the life that we have here, but also our eternity. Okay? That's his favorite pastime. Luke chapter 11, verse 24. Luke 11, verse 24. Jesus tells us here, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, what do he do? He walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I'll return unto my house whence I come out. Okay. So that's what the unclean spirit do. When they get booted out of one place, they're going to walk around, walking around. And what kind of place they walk in? Dry places. Remember when Jesus told the woman, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, they say if they do this to a green tree, you know, just imagine what they're going to do, do to a dry one. Okay? Representing wickedness or people who choose sin. That's where Satan likes to work, to walk. You know? All right. Uh, this uh, quotation is taken from Great Controversy, page 505. The apostate is never at rest except as he finds sympathy and support by inducing others to follow his example. Okay. Does that sound familiar? 
You know, when we have a gripe or grudge against someone, the first thing we will do, we're going to look for support and sympathy. Yeah. Right? So Satan tells the Lord, oh, I'm going up and down on the earth. Okay, next part of the conversation, verse 8. Job chapter 1, verse 8. Someone please, out loud. So then, the Lord challenges Satan. Eh? Oh, so you've been walking up and down. You're going around. So, yeah, right. Have you, ever have you ever met Job? Have you considered my servant Job? And then he presses the point. A perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God. Of all the millions of people, I'm not sure the exact figure, might even be billion, of all the people on the earth, God has to give the example of Job to Satan. And that's the one person that Satan don't want to know about. To Satan, Job stick out like a sore thumb. Because it has been Satan's gripe from the very beginning of his rebellion. Right up to the present time and still going now. That God's law is imperfect. It's no good. And when somebody like Job pop up and prove Satan wrong, he just will want to look the other way. Okay. Desire of Ages, page 761. In the opening of the great controversy, Satan had declared that the law of God could not be obeyed. That justice was inconsistent with mercy. And that should the law be broken, it would be impossible for the sinner to be pardoned. Okay? So that's what he was saying. That's through his own warped reasoning. He says, first of all, the law of God is no good. And secondly, as soon as someone breaks the law of God, someone sins, there should be no pardon, no forgiveness. And now I can see, I've always wondered, you know, when, when uh, Jesus came down to resurrect Moses from the grave, his grave, and how Satan tried to claim the body of Moses. He really thought he was doing the right thing. He, he really believes that there's no room for pardon or forgiveness. But Jesus didn't want to mess around. He said, no, the Lord rebuke you. Moses, let's go. And we praise the Lord for that. God is a God of justice. The standards of the law is kept up, but he's also a God of mercy. Mercy mixed with justice. That's the part that Satan can't understand. He only go for the justice part with no mercy. Okay? And uh, I think he did the same to the high priest, Joshua, Zechariah chapter 3. Lord tell him the same thing. The Lord rebuke you. Yeah. All right. Let's move on. Then in verse, so when... Uh, the Lord tells Satan, uh, have you seen Job? And we look at Satan's response in verse 9 and verse 10. Someone like to read that, please? <coughs> Has not thou made an hedge about him? And about his house, and about all that he hath on every side, thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. Okay. So what uh, Satan is trying to tell um, God is that Job is taking bribes. You know, God, you you bribing, you giving him plenty blessing. That's why he's fearing you. And also you put an hedge about him. Well, that he was partly right there. I mean, Job being a man of integrity, he's bounded there by the law of God and by angels. Okay. But uh, so Satan says, all right, you are increasing his substance. Verse 11, but put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he'll curse thee to thy face. 
And it's, uh, it is, uh, I think it's important that we learn these lessons, the rules of engagement and what is taking place here because this local incident will be repeated worldwide, is being repeated. This is the great controversy here. This is why God gave the book of Job and the book of Genesis for Moses to write in the 40 years that he was staying in Midian. Okay? Moses is the author of the book of Job. I mean, he put it down. Okay? And simply because in the book of Job, you have the principles of the great controversy, and in the book of Genesis, you have the principles of righteousness by faith. Okay? So these two books, and uh, Ellen White says here, the long years amid, amid desert solitudes were not lost. Not only was Moses gaining a preparation for the great work before him, but during this time, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote the book of Genesis and also the book of Job, which would be read with the deepest interest by the people of God until the close of time. So that's found in Signs of the Times, February 19th, 1880. Okay. Because of this thing, because of the great controversy, the same, we, we're going to meet same circumstances. So, verse 11, then Satan said, But put forth thine hand now, touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Okay? So, touch all his possessions. That's the only reason why he's being faithful to you, because you're blessing him too much. Hmm. So the Lord said, all right. Um... Verse 12, the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So that's the rules of engagement. First test. First test. You can touch all his substance and everything. Don't touch his body. Okay, with him. And you know what? Can Satan break out of those rules? Can he overturn them or can he go past the limits? No. When God set the limit, that's it. Okay. It says in Job chapter 38, in verse 11, when God sets the limit, eh? Job 38, verse 11, it says, And he said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud wave be stayed. So when God said the limit, all right, you just come up this far and no further. That's it. Never mind how, how strong or powerful anybody will be, they'll never go past that limit. Okay? That's God's word. That's how he can chain the devil down in this earth for 1,000 years. During that 1,000 years, judgment. A chain, you know, locking the dragon down on this earth in prison. Yeah, that's just his word. He just talked, that's it. Mm. That's how powerful it is. All right, so. The straight away when Satan is given room to move and is given power to. See, notice the power that Satan has to persecute Job. He didn't have it in himself. He had to borrow it from God. That makes sense. I mean, who has all the power anyway? Matthew 28, verse 18. All power is given unto me. Okay? So that's all the more reason for nobody to boast. Right, so now he moves. He moves in now. Uh, where are we up to? Verse 13. Then there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing, the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain thy servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So that's the first move he made. Kill all the ox oxen or drive them away kill all the servants, and just leave one to take the message. Okay. Now he's giving his, 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 his report there of what happened to the oxen. And as soon as he withdraws, the second one step in. That's how fast. Okay. What's the next one? Verse 16. 
While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone am escaped alone to tell thee. So now it's the, the sheep, the one that's getting destroyed, and all the servants except one to take the bad news. Okay? Now this brings in another uh, something else we see here. That when Satan is given the, the license, he can also bring fire down from heaven. Now, he couldn't do that in the days of Elijah, okay? because God never let him. So, this time the fire come down. <coughs> Alright, so as that second servant, when he give the report, when he come away, the third one come in. Verse 17. Someone please. So now it's the camel's turn. They're all carried away. All of the servants except one. And then in verse 18, the Satan go for Job's children. And this would be very painful indeed for the man. In verse 18. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Okay. So that's the last one. All of the children, ten children that he had, all killed during this calamity. Well, we can just imagine how the, the, the feelings going, the emotions going through Job. Okay? Everything that man depend on, you know, all his material possessions all gone, and even his children. It's bad enough when you lose one child. Okay? But these ten in one shot, you know, this, you know, he is very, very uh, sad now. But then, in spite of it all, we find in verse 20, then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and he worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Okay? I can understand now why in the book of James, I think it's in chapter 5, it refers to the patience of Job. You know? Must be a very patient man after all these calamities, and he keep on being faithful to God. Okay? Um, yeah, that's something that we need to take note, and you know, we try to follow that example. Because for us to be sure, I mean, for, for us to understand, every one of us, we strike some sort of trial, and, and they'll get bigger as we come towards the end of time. And we have to understand, never mind how bleak the situation looks, that God is in control. Okay? And we have to be faithful all the time, and at the end, God going to win, God going to deliver. Okay? So that's the first test. We're going to go into the second test now, but before we look at the second one, uh, I find a similarity with Gideon's army. How, ma how many times was Gideon's army tested? You look at it in Judges chapter 7, in verse 1 and verse 2. Okay? The first time was, anybody who's fearful, let him return. That was the first one. 22,000 went, only 10,000 left. Then the second one in verse 3, take them down to the water and observe how they drink the water. Okay? And the ones that kept on moving and lapping the water up like a dog and on the move, set them aside, there was only 300. 
the ones who are very lackadaisical, they sit down, you know, look around, enjoy, make themselves comfortable, then they drink water, tell them to go back home. Okay? Two, two tests. And we see the same thing here with Job. Now we're going to look at his second test. Again, there was a day, this is Job chapter 2, verse 1. <coughs> Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Okay. He, he, he lost the first round, first battle. He never feel ashamed. He go back again to heaven, even though he's lost. Okay. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou not considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, perfect and upright man? And still he holdeth fast his integrity, even though thou moved me against him to destroy him without cause. Okay, how's it, Satan? See, you took away all his possessions, all his children, all dead now. Look at him, he's still faithful to me. How is Satan going to answer that? This is how he answered it. Verse 4. Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. Okay, yeah, that's because you never t let me touch his life. Hmm. See, he's always jumping. First of all, he said, you bless him too much, all his material possessions. When that never worked, change again. No consistency when you're in rebellion against God. Let me touch his life now. And then we see how he's going to react. Mm. Verse 5. But put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. Okay. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. All right, you touch him. He's in your hand now. But don't. God set the limit again. Don't take away his life. Leave it like that. But the rest you can do. Straight away, Satan, move in. Verse 7. Verse 7, please, someone. Okay, <coughs> so straight away, Satan goes straight for Job's health. Okay? And that's one of the most miserable things of all when we get sick. Eh? It's so depressing. So he go now. He's the trial getting tougher now. And he give him boils from the crown of his head down to the sole of his foot. Now I can remember quite a while ago, long ago, I was still in the world. And you know, the boil come up. Man, just one boil, they spoil your whole day. Mm. Very, very painful. I can't imagine having boils all joined together. Anyway, that's what he go through. Very, very painful. And it is so painful, so uncomfortable, he got to, you know, the soft material, like the soft ash, you know, the leftover, the firewood, and you've done your cooking, put the soft ash together, make a little mound, and then he sit on it. That's the only comfort that he can find, to try and relieve all the suffering. And then his wife step in again, make it worse. Then said his wife, this is verse 9, his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. Yes, insult piled upon insult. Okay. And uh, I kind of, and I was thinking of this. Uh, oh, no wonder God didn't, uh, Satan didn't destroy the wife in the first round. You know, just the children kept him. You know, use her later. But anyway, that wasn't enough to shake Job. Eh? Verse 10, and he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speakest. What? Shall we receive go good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. And I praise the Lord for that. It's very encouraging because I meet so many of my acquaintances and s my friends you know, they say, oh, the devil is too strong, and we'll always fall and you know, with a defeatist kind of attitude. But we see here, no, looking at Job's example, that give us hope. Okay? 
And even Jesus' example, well, that's another big story altogether. Eh? So victory can be got. Okay, so in all this did not Job sin or with his lips or with any part. Eh? Okay, so when we're looking at this lesson here, <coughs> I want to apply this now to us as individuals. Okay, I said before we're going to go through the same thing. Well, this is the Bible verse to prove it. Can you check out Daniel chapter 12, verse 10? Daniel 12, verse 10. What is the sequence of events that will come to each of God's people? Someone would like to read that one out, please. Thank you, Carmen. So many shall be purified, okay, made white, now you sanctified, justified, sanctified, and the third step, tried, 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 testing. Heaven, you know, in another spirit prophecy quotation, it says the inhabitants of heaven, they are looking so much interested they're very interested in what's taking place in the great controversy in this earth. They want to be double sure that nobody half cook is going to get back into heaven. They're so intent, they're watching. And when Jesus says, oh, don't worry, I died for them, and they go, yeah, 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 but... Uh, Jesus said, wait, we're going to put them under extreme pressure, and you see, they'll come out like shining gold. That's the reason for the test. When you go to grade school, primary school, you have a test to show that you are prepared to go to secondary school. The same thing, before you leave planet Earth, you're going to be tested to show that you're prepared and fit to go and stay in heaven. What's going to happen if we still ever put our way our sins and we go end up in the New Jerusalem? Will you enjoy it there? Ah, you want to run away. Okay. So that's the purpose and that's why all these tests and trials are coming. That's one reason. And the second one, the tests are meant to purify our characters. That's why the from in the judgment time, judgment goes together with suffering and trials. They're, they're closely because they work together. Okay? Lo look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 32, what happened when we are judged? By the way, this has been going on from 1844. <coughs> Chapter 11, verse 32. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the law. The judging and the chastening go together. That's where the trials come in. Now, God doesn't follow the, the kind of edicts that are coming out of the United Nations where it's wrong to give your child a spanking and all that kind of thing. He knows much better. He knows we always like to learn the hard way. And so he gives us hard lessons in righteousness. Trials. Chastening. This is how character develops. And they, it's... It's specifically in the time of judgment. Now, I know God's people have been persecuted all down the line, but especially so from 1844 onwards. When the pioneers that came out of the Millerite movement, when the judgment began in 1844, what was the first event that they met? Great disappointment. That's the first chastening come from the Lord. And that's a purifying process. Out of 50,000 in the Millerite movement, in that humongous shaking, how many survived? Only 50. And that's been the story ever since, and it will keep on going right until the close of probation. So when you give, commit your life to the Lord, you better tighten up your belt and dig your heels in and brace yourself, because they're just going to keep on coming. Mm. All right, let's go back. Malachi chapter 3 in verse 3. Malachi, last book in the Old Testament. 
Oh, you can read verse 1 first, just to get the context. Behold, okay, verse 1, we all there? All right. Chapter 3 in verse 1, start in verse 1. Okay, someone out loud and clear, please. Thank you. So here we see in verse 1 that um, it's a prophecy here. I'll send my messenger, he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come where? Okay, this is pointing to when Jesus moved from the holy place into the most holy place. Okay? You can tie this up with Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 and verse 10, All right. when he comes to the ancient of days. Okay? This is 1844. And the messenger that come, you know, preparing the way, you know, the Millerite movement as they give the loud cry for just before 1844, okay? Now, yeah, that's the context, around 1844, the time of judgment. Now, what's happening during this time? Verse 2, but who may abide the day of his coming? You know, the day of judgment. Who shall stand when he appears? appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire like fuller's soap and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver he shall purify the sons of levi you know the sanctuary will never be cleansed until the people are cleansed they go together you can check it in leviticus chapter 16 okay cleansing of the sanctuary cleansing of the people of god's people now I, I heard this somewhere, and you can, if you differ, then you can tell me later or tell me now. But the people who refine silver, okay, they stir it and they'll, you know, go through the process, the heating process, and they reckon that the silver will only be ready when you can see your reflection in it. Okay? Yeah. That's what they say. <coughs> and that is a very good parallel to what's going on now since 1844. God is refining his people like silver. And when he can see his reflection in us, then Jesus will come. Okay? Hmm? Yeah, the dross is being taken away. All our weaknesses and darling sins, this the time has got to be put away. And, and we better not procrastinate and, you know, try to lengthen the thing. Because we don't know where the line is. We might be still playing around like that. Somebody else come and take our place. Okay? <coughs> All right. Romans chapter 8, verse 18 and 19, as we start to close down. Romans 8, verse 18 and 19. <coughs> Okay, verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. There should never come a time, a point in our experience where we start to have self-pity. Man, I, it's, it's unreasonable, you know? And then for God's people, for affliction, if sometimes, you know, we feel the thing starting to get heavy and it's starting to make us, you know, starting to break us, just, just try and look into the future. Just look at the glory at all the things that God is preparing for you. That's the best part of the journey. I said it before, I'll say it again. Not the starting, not the middle. As long as the ending is right, it's all right. Okay? Everything, that's the best part. And Paul, he had visions of heaven. He's seen what heaven is all about. And he couldn't find any words in the alphabet or in the human language to describe it. He said, the eye hath not seen. The ear hath not heard. The mind of man, as fertile as our imagination can be, cannot reach the reality 
of what God is preparing for his people. It's just out of this world. Mm -hmm. And brothers and sisters, it would be a pity, it would be very, very sad, if we missed out on all what God is preparing for us just because we got hooked up or tangled up with some small, trivial thing on this earth. Okay? Waste of time. All right, back to Romans chapter 8. Verse 19, the next verse. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's what God is, that's what's holding up the show. Every time we, you know, many times we pray, Lord, please return, please come. You know, we, we, we're tired of this world. And, and if only God would speak to us and say, look, I'm waiting for you people. You're the one that's being late, not me. Yeah? And that's what all of creation is waiting for, for the manifestation of the sons of God. Christ object lessons, page 69, when the character of God is perfectly reproduced in his people, then Jesus will come. Amen. Okay. So thank you everyone for your attention. May the Lord bless each one of you this morning. <coughs> Let us pray. <coughs> Our oh, Father, which art in heaven, we come before you at this time to worship you and to praise your name. Thank you, Father, for the many blessings you have bestowed upon us during the past few days. And Father, I pray for each individual here at this time. You know our weaknesses, you know our needs, and you know the challenges that we face. And I pray, Father, that you may meet each one according to their needs. We ask for your encouragement and strength upon each one that each may be a witness for you in their corner of the vineyard. We pray also for the families represented here, especially the members who have not committed themselves to you. We pray that you give them no rest, that they may submit to you. We thank you and we ask that you continue to be with us throughout the rest of the camp. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs>